guys. So today we're doing a marker tutorial. I've already applied the frisket because uh, you guys have seen me apply frisket many, many times. You really don't need another tutorial on that. And I applied the frisket mainly on some of the flowers in the foreground and all on Kara because I'm going to be doing alcohol mists. So I wanted to start with Botanical, which is an Adirondack ink color, mostly because that was what inspired this piece to begin with. And I'm going to go ahead and remove this piece of mixed media paper from my Strathmore mixed media pad. I really like using that heavier paper for these sort of things. Know that I ever prime that pump. All right, got that first layer down, and next I want to do some sort of greenish yellow as we move out of the foliage. And then I want to do a blue green and I'm using stream for that over here in sort of the shaded area. And these are homemade alcohol misters and you can check out my video on that on this YouTube channel. And then before we call it quits, I want some blue up there. So let's see what I have. I have Baja blue, which is a pretty nice blue color. What else? That might be it. That might be the best blue I currently have in a mister for this. I was kind of hoping I had pool in a mister, and I'm sure I do, I just don't see it. So let's use some Baja blue over here. And we'll go ahead and do a little bit of indigo kind of at the top. Okay, now it's time to let that mess sort of dry. So I am gonna do another spritz down there. Let that mess dry and clean up the craft sheet and this craft sheet is non-stick and although alcohol inks do dry really fast, this is kind of a snap to clean up. So for this sort of stuff, I really like being able to reuse the ink. So I've got a bottle of rubbing alcohol and I'm going to go get some scrap paper so I can soak all this up. All right, so I've got a sheet of inexpensive watercolor paper, and this is almost a perfect frame. So I'm gonna go ahead and spritz some rubbing alcohol. You can also use colorless blender. It's really what you have in ha on hand, but rubbing alcohol is very inexpensive. Spritz that. Place this and press. Hopefully, we'll get a kind of a cool frame design that can be used in a different illustration. Oh yeah, look at that, isn't that neat? I'm excited about that. I think we can get another one too. So there's still some goodness on the mat, so I'm gonna spritz it again. Oh, I need to refill my rubbing alcohol bottle, I think. Okay. 
and apply another sheet of inexpensive watercolor paper and do the same thing. And these are gonna make for neat frames for some undetermined illustration in the future. But pretty cool. And there's even more still on there. So I can use, um, I really could use a variety of things, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and just clean it up. Mostly because I don't have the cut paper handy. So you can clean it up with just good old rubbing alcohol. And this is a Tim Holtz Ink Essentials craft mat, which works really well. I think it has silicone covering on it over like the fabric underneath. So nothing actually sticks to it. You can clean pretty much anything off. At least I haven't found anything that sticks to it, which makes reusing sprays a lot easier. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this off with paper towels and rubbing alcohol, and then I'll check back in with you guys. Okay, so my work surface is clean and my illustration is dry. It's time to remove it. If you have like little fine point craft tweezers, they are great for this sort of thing. I don't yet own those. I mean, every video I do, I talk about them. Uh, but I do have kind of claw-like nails right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start prying this up. And you can see it wasn't a perfect mask. There is some seepage. Um, it's easier to correct small areas like that, especially if it's on the face, than to correct um, large areas like these daisies in the background. They, those may or may not ever get to the level of um, lightness that I need since they are white daisies. And there are a few tricks regarding that as well. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm trying to find my Copic Colorless Blender, which I know is in here. It's like underneath a whole bunch of other markers. I'm going to go ahead and use my Copus, Copic Colorless Blender to push back some of these intense colors on the flowers. I'll do that in time lapse. Alright, so I'm not having quite as much luck in pushing these darker colors out as I had hoped. And I kind of figured that was going to happen. It was more wishful thinking on my part. Um, now I can start, at least with the yellows, I can start applying a bright sunny yellow and uh, just hoping that like white highlights will help that pop out. So I'm going to do that right now because I may need a lot of layers to do it. And I'm using a custom marker. It is a Copic sketch filled with Ranger's Sunshine Yellow. It's a really nice, bright sort of buttery yellow that I thought would work really well in this instance. And I'm gonna set that aside and grab a greeny yellow chartreuse. And this is a Dick Blick marker, just to add some of that shading in there. And I may go over this several times. The next thing I'm going to do is, I'm gonna do this early because it takes forever to dry, is I'm gonna use the Copic Opaque White on these daisies to help them pop out of the picture plane more. Okay, so I've got my Copic Opaque White and I've got a little cup of water, really don't need much, and a synthetic brush. I 
And as we learned together in a few of my other illustrations, you can indeed go over your opaque white with Copic marker if you let it dry fully. So we can always go back and add details. This brush might be a little on the big side. And I want my opaque white to be a little bit watery because I do want all of that spray to sort of show through to influence the colors I'm putting down. And I am using a softer synthetic brush. It's a Neptune. Um, and these are intended for watercolor. They are supposed to mimic uh, natural fibers. They don't. But they are perfect for this sort of a more delicate application where a stiff synthetic would um, really cause more harm than good. You see those white daisy leaves are really popping out now. I'm also going to add some to the yellow and coat color over that a little bit later after that's all dry. And for really for best results with coloring over opaque white, you want to be very light handed. So you don't want to use this for major corrections. The only color I'm going to be putting over this is just like some very light blue to sort of shade the flower. And you want to give your opaque white plenty of time to dry. dry, 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 dry. And I prefer to use Copic opaque white that is in the large jar. I don't really care for the small jar. I like being able to use my own brushes. Because sometimes I want to cover larger areas like I'm doing here. And if you cover your line art, that's okay. You're just gonna have to redo it a little bit. Now, if you go in too early, your Copic marker will reactivate this water-based opaque white and it'll pick it up. So you do wanna give it lots of time to dry. And for those of you who are new to my work or new to my channel, I am coloring an illustration of the main character from my ongoing children's watercolor comic, Seven Inch Kara. Hence why the daisies are so large in proportion to her. She's just a tiny little thing. And you can find out more about Seven Inch Kara by checking out my blog, netosoup.blogspot.com and searching Seven Inch Kara. Um, or you can go to my website, natosoup.com, and it's um, in my shop. The first volume is for sale. So if you like what you see here, if you enjoy my tutorials, that is a great way to show that you enjoy my work and, uh, you know, get to enjoy even more of my illustration. I am a comic illustrator by trade. Um, with a master's degree from SCAD in sequential art. So, you know, comics are definitely my passion, but I do enjoy doing standalone illustrations and I enjoy teaching. So on this illustration, I will have to go back in with my ink and it was Sailor Mitsuo Ida. I will have to go back in when everything is dry and sort of reestablish my line work on these daisies. Otherwise, it's going to look really messy. All right, so we have the base layer for the daisies done. You can see some areas are a little thicker than others. If you really want to, you can take a fairly um, dried out clean brush. Looking for something to dry this on. Nothing is catching my eyes. That's what pants are for, right? Uh, you can go over and sort of redistribute areas where it's pooled 
that's going to make your dry time take a little bit longer. But if you are really insistent that everything be even and uh, neat looking, it'll help out a lot. And it helps to do it while it's not entirely dry. I mean, you can reactivate opaque white with water at any time. Um, but it does go a little easier if it is not entirely dry, but also not like goopy or pooled on your paper. Your paper, your paper, your paper, your paper, your paper. All right, so I'm gonna let this dry out and clean up my work area and come back. All right, guys, I'm back. My Copic Opaque White has had a little bit of time to dry, but I am gonna let it dry longer before I start applying color to it. And I did go ahead and pick out some of my colors. Now, one of the first problems I need to solve is I need to marry this dress into the fade of the background. And to do that, I'm going to use Mermaid and Bottle, two custom colors that I, uh, using Ranger inks, I added to my Copic collection to just sort of lighten the background up and also do some shading. And there's a variety of ways you can handle this sort of a problem. I mostly want the shading, regardless of what I color this fringe, I want the shading to reflect the area that it came from, to reflect the local color. And since there's so much green, I'm using this nice blue-green there to sort of blend the two together. And then whatever color I put on top of it will end up knocking this color back, but hopefully the whole will look like it belongs together. Because that's, that's really the goal, is you don't want all these disparate parts to stand out. You want them to look like they belong stream is a little bit dark for what I'm doing, but it really does help blend the two areas together. And this is really easy to do in watercolor. It's a little more difficult with markers, but it's definitely a technique that's worth learning. And that's one of the reasons why I like these thicker marker papers or mixed media papers or watercolor papers. I know a lot of people don't like them. They have problems with them. You know, they have their own opinions about them and that's great. But one of the reasons why I like this is because it does allow me to sort of marry areas that otherwise would be very noticeably different, would stand out as just visually wrong. It allows me to reconcile that. So I'm going to go ahead now and knock in some of these preliminary shadows on the dress. And this dress is actually going to be kind of an autumn uh, arrangement of colors, browns and, and reds, because I thought they would it would stand out really nicely against all this blue and yellow green and and blue green and blue green and blue green and blue green and and when i put the colors that i'm going to use on top of this it will definitely knock this color back some cuz that's the nature of alcohol markers um, it will push prior layers to the back of the paper which again, I'm fine with, that's why I'm doing it this way. And if I decide that I wanna bring that color back in, I can always add it later, add it later, add it later, add it later. And if it's a little intense, you can always knock it back with a lighter color before you add that additional layer or you can knock it back with the colorless blender. But it's really good to work outside of your comfort zone um, especially with markers, you know, we we tend to find a rut that works for us and then stick to it. Um, and with alcohol markers, when things really start to look good is when you've done things that made you a little bit nervous. So I also noticed an area where my masking frisket just was like a little bit out of alignment. So I'm going to go ahead and remedy that as well. Ooh, that's a good green for that. <laughs> that works really well, actually. So 
sort of push the colors up next to the skin. It doesn't have to be exact, it just needs to be close. Then I have to remember where I put this because I'm going to be using this color later. All right, so I'm also going to knock the color I just put down that I can't find now. I'm going to knock that back a little bit with Colorless Blender. but only in certain areas. And um, this is a useful technique if you enjoy a sort of watercolor effect to your alcohol markers. Actually, this one's getting a little dry. Maybe this one. Okay, so that is mostly handled we're gonna start on usually you guys know I would do her skin next but I actually think I'm gonna go with the dress next because right now it's one of the bigger challenges and that's exciting for me so I'm gonna go ahead and start filling in her dress and I'm starting with YG 11 from Copic And you guys, if you're, again, if you're new to my channel, I like to mix brands a lot. I like to make my own colors. I like to um, put alcohol inks in markers that, you know, don't have markers. Um, I really enjoy customizing my own set and customizing my marker experience. And I highly recommend you do the same. And I have quite a few videos. Um, reviewing other brands of markers if you are looking for you know just a little bit of help getting started with that I know it can be intimidating I'm gonna add another layer of this YG 11 And you guys can start to see how that blue-green is influencing it. I really should have honestly probably put some more blue-green in there. can always do that with this lighter shade, which is pool. And it's a beautiful color. It's a ranger color. With lovely sort of aqua one of my favorite colors in their line. That's another thing, I don't actually do paid product placements, so um, my opinions are my own and products that I love are products that I tend to use, so you will see them pop up often. And I've started getting really mixed media when it comes to the markers that I use. So while this is still damp, I'm going to put G24, which is Copic's Willow. Willow, 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 Willow. And then I'm going to go over this with the color I just used to sort of blend the two together. Because they are pretty different colors. And then lastly, this, for now, this YG45. Which is, despite being a YG, it's actually a very blue-influenced YG, so it's a good color to end with. And you see we've lost pretty much m almost all of those influences from Stream. So, I may end up going back in and adding them back a little bit. I 
and then blending them back out. Doing things with markers is a lot of back and forth. Knowing when to work on things while they're still wet, a lot of working on them while they're still dry. So if you're struggling with them, that's okay. We all do. In fact, the fact that you are making mistakes or making things you're not happy with is great because it means you're learning. If you don't make mistakes, if all you ever do is follow what everybody else does, you're not really learning anything. So we've got her shirt done. And I didn't perfectly plan where different things on her dress were going to be. Because I sometimes I do enjoy just going in without a real game plan and figuring things out as I go along. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and use this Blick Studio brush marker. And I'll tell you the color in a minute on this first ruffle down at the bottom. And that is 007, which is spice. And you can see um, stream really did influence the color down there, which is what I wanted. Um, so it's blending in pretty well, I would say. And I'm going to continue to work it in even down here where it isn't drawn in the line art because I want it to look like I want it to look like it's fading into the darkness, which it is what it looks like. And then I'm going to go over and give it another layer. Oh, excuse me. Okay. All right, and then I'm gonna switch over to 036, another Blick Studio brush marker. And knock in a few more of those shadows. That's a darker orange. And it really does look like it she's coming from that environment at least to me it does all right so we have that first layer of orange down at the bottom and I know it doesn't really look that orange and again I'm okay with that um the intention isn't for it to be like whoa that's orange but more um you know just sort of like a reference of it so I'm going to work on coloring in the different patches on this patchwork dress. And I'm basically going to complete one patch at a time instead of like um, trying to work in batches where I would do like one layer on all of the all of the patches and then move on. And it's mostly for my own sanity. Um, with alcohol markers, there are so many different ways you can work that you can find a way that works for you and, um, you know, helps you create the best work you can. So don't, don't feel bad if, like, your method of working is different from mine. It's really all about um, what helps you make good work. Shoot, I think I grabbed the wrong. I did. That's okay, because I can blend it out. Thankfully, we're working in the same color family, so it's not a noticeable difference. Anyway, I'm going to work on the patches on this dress, and I'm going to do that in time lapse, and I'll check in with you guys once I've finished that.
All right, guys, so the dress is pretty much done. I'm mostly just adding details. And with these little beads that are the buttons on her dress, it's really easy just to add a small circular shadow at the bottom and then come in later and add a white highlight to each and it'll really make it look like it's a bead. And the darker you can get with that shadow, the more it's gonna look like a bead because glass um, sort of traps shadows in. So even going dark with like a brown is really going to help that out. And for this glass bottle, uh, so I decided that the, the patchwork that would be underneath the bottle would be this kind of color. So I had to go way lighter than that because of the way glass sort of affects color. Um, at least in illustration. So I went with like the lightest blue green I had and then I used pool on top of that which was the lightest color used in these squares using mermaid only really for accents. So um, hopefully that reads more as as um, glass over patchwork. And I do need to fill in the grass area behind. So that sort of completes the illusion And all that's left on this dress is to color in that, um, the string on her, on her water bottle. So I think I want to do that with, um, I kind of wanted to avoid doing it with the yellow, but I might just. So we'll start with honey, with Blix Honey Yellow. So when you're coloring something tiny like this cord over an area you've already colored, you really need to use a light hand because you don't want your color to bleed out of the area. And um, you can correct some mistakes with some white, but it's really just easier to be careful early on and not spend your time correcting it than it would be to spend your time correcting it. Now I'm trying to be delicate when adding these shadows in. So we've pretty much got the dress colored. I am gonna go back with some, um, what's the word? The white Signo to add um, decoration to some of those squares on her dress. But I'm gonna do that at the end. I'm not worried about that right now. Um, so next, we have her eyes and her skin and her hair to do and then we're finished with the foreground other than adding some shading and I'm just sort of looking around my studio well looking around my workstation area because there is a color that I put it away I did that's where it went I'm gonna go ahead and knock in the whites of her eyes and then I'm gonna put some of pool on my non-stick mat and pick it up just sort of dab it in there and I'm gonna clean that off later So what I last want to do is I do want to go back in certain areas and sort of tighten up that um, blue shadow color. But I don't know if I have anything between BG, BG000 and Pool that will really work for it. And I may just have to go dark and fix it. Because I do want the grass to cast some shadow onto her clothes. I do want there to be some local color. Color, color, color. And her eyes are a little bit too blue. So we're going to go in with the colorless blender and push some of that back just a bit. Okay, so we're finally on to her skin. And for her skin, I do want to affect certain areas 
Um, and I also need to carefully pick a shadow color um, because her, the, the cast shadow would not be purple so much as it would be a blue. Let's see. That's, that's Baja blue. That's going to be a little too dark. Yeah, it's too dark. So I grabbed three likely blues, blue B triple zero, which looks like that and is running a little dry. B01, which is much more promising, and then B02, which I am pretty sure is gonna be too dark. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with a combination of B01 and B triple zero used to blend it out, and that's probably the same blue I'm gonna use on those background flowers. So we're gonna start with B01. Just sort of knocking in some of the shaded areas. And then maybe just a little. And set that aside. And now I'm going to start coloring her skin and I'm going to handle it pretty similarly to the way I always handle it. So if you need reference for that, I do have other videos where I do render Caucasian skin. So you should check those out for a step-by-step -step look at how I handle skin. So I'm going to do this in time lapse. Okay, so we're going to get to work now, now that Kara is pretty much finished being rendered. Uh, do need to put some rat in the mouth, but other than that, she's pretty much done. Um, I need to start getting to work on those background colors, background flowers. And I was able to bring some local color into her dark brown hair by using the even darker BG78, which is brown, bronze, which is good. That was something I was looking for. And I brought some local color into the yellow using B01. Um, the combination of the yellow and the blue was a bit of a green. So that was exactly what I wanted. And I'm going to go ahead and start working on these flowers, these white flowers, the daisies in, in the background. And there is a chance that this is going to ruin my nibs. So um, I am going to work carefully. And we'll find out together. And that way you don't have to ruin your nibs. Just, just me. I can ruin my nibs. That's what, that's what we watch YouTube for, right? To watch other people do things we're interested in and to see if it'll ruin the materials we have and then make a decision based off that. So I'd rather ruin my nibs than you guys ruin yours because I do keep spares. And first I'm putting B000 down and then I'm going to do B01 and then I'm going to clean up that line work. And when you're coloring over opaque white, if you haven't seen some of my other videos where I do it, it's going to take more layers of color. And it lo looks like um, it makes it so that you can see the background through it. I don't know if I'm like slowly wiping away some of that opaque white or removing some of the translucency. I don't know yet if it's going to dry completely opaque. But I kind of like the fact that now you can see some of the background through that. I think that looks kind of cool.
And if we do get to see the background through it, that's going to be what Bob Ross would call a happy accident. And all through undergrad, I didn't understand what happy accidents were because I was taking digital art classes. Um, and I had a professor who, he didn't really like my work to begin with, but he was constantly telling me I should strive for happy accidents. But when I would scan like traditional watercolor paper, right, to use that as a base, he would get on my case for that and say, well, what's the point of that? Why don't you just do watercolor then? Um, so anything digital that I would have been able to do, that would have been a happy accident. I feel like I was discouraged from learning that. But I'm, I'm finally at the point, especially with the art supply reviews, where I have to try so many things and I do so much mixed media stuff that I'm really getting a, a feel for what happy accidents look like. Actually, think about um, the sort of things we say to people when we're in positions of authority that can like really have a negative impact on how they view their work or how they go about making work or how they how they learn. Um, and I think in his instance, he just didn't he was straight out from grad school, so he didn't have a lot of experience. And now that I have my master's degree in comics, some of the stuff he said to me and to other students. I would never say that to somebody because like I know how, first of all, I know how painful that is. And I'm also acutely aware that even though I have that M that MFA, that master's degree, I, there's still so much for me to learn. And I'm constantly encountering kids and teenagers who, you know, through their own study, they just know so much more than me. Very humbling experience. So um, I do take what I say to younger people or less experienced people very seriously. I and mean, I try not to discourage anybody from making art or finding their own way. I mean, even if you can't do it professionally, that's not a reason why you shouldn't do it. Especially if you love it and derive pleasure from it. Incidentally, it was uh, the way <laughs> the the things that were said to me in his classes that really pushed me towards traditional art because I took traditional art classes at the time as well, um, and I loved those and I got along very well with those professors. Um, and they, but they were also more experienced professors than he was. Um, and I fell in love with traditional media because everything I was doing digitally was just me trying to recreate traditional media in digital media. The school I went to at the time for my undergrad was University of New Orleans and they didn't have um, an illustration program. They were supposed to and then Hurricane Katrina hit and that kind of got washed away with so many other things. Um, so I was basically trying to make for myself an illustration major in within you know the digital graphics media, um, concentration. And I was very upfront with that with the professor when he came into the department. I was like a senior or junior by the time he came in. I was very upfront about what I was looking for. Unfortunately, that was not not good enough, so. And I know some of you have asked me about whether, you know, that you're interested in art school yourself, paying a lot of money to go to an art school. And there were a lot of things I learned while I was at SCAD that I don't know that I would have learned anywhere else. And then there were a lot of things that I should have been taught, like professional practices that just, that just didn't happen while I was there. It was, there was a class on it. My booty was in the seat in that class on it. The professor just opted not to teach that class. They showed up and they didn't teach. They were on Tumblr the whole time. And the school knew about it. Uh, pretty much every student reported it. And we were given some options, but one of the options, the, the only option that was really a fair option was everyone has to agree that this class wasn't fairly taught and we all have to retake it. And 
more than half the class was graduating that semester. So it was pretty much just like a, you guys need to shut up and quit complaining so we can graduate. Um, I hope they're doing well. I hope they're not struggling from their lack of a background in that. Basically, though, where I was going with that is, um, you know, the sort of people who really, 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 really want to go to art school. There is nothing that I can say to you guys that will dissuade you. You will be convinced that your experiences will be different. You will be convinced that it's just going to be different for, for you and that I'm an idiot. And, I, and I'm telling you guys like this because I was the same way. So I know for a fact that there are some of you who I will not be able to dissuade from it. And that's fine, my guy. Okay, um, if you're on the fence, there are there's so much excellent art education available for both for free and for payment on the internet um, through YouTube through other sites. I highly recommend you spend at least your summer before you commit. You spend your summer studying that sort of stuff that you don't have to pay for that everybody has access to, and um, you know just. Focus on that, bone up on that. And then if you still really feel like you're behind everybody else and you're not going to catch up, and the only way you can do it is with art school, then you know that will better tell you whether it's for you or not. There's a lot of things you're gonna get if, and this isn't, it isn't guaranteed. There are a lot of things you can get from art school. You can get a phenomenal community of peers who understand your vision, are passionate about the same things you're passionate about. Professors who are interested in the sort of work you make, who can, who've worked in the industry, who can give you guidance, who can introduce you to people. A school network that can introduce you to people, put your work in front of people. Um, a network of peers that you can draw on, other alums who can put your name in for jobs, who can uh, promote your work to the right sort of people to help you get further in your career. Um, those are all things an art school can give you. That's not necessarily what you're going to get, and you may get that at a different type of, of school. Um, in Tennessee here, there is Watkins College of Art, and MTSU has a um, middle, I actually don't know what the acronym is for other than Middle Tennessee, but both of those are schools that I see a lot of people, um, that's where they go to get their degree. Um, it costs a whole lot less than SCAD. A lot of them don't have to move away and pay all those expenses too, and they're getting a decent quality education depending on the field they're going into and they're able to find jobs right off the bat because local businesses here in Nashville are looking to hire people who came from those colleges. They're looking to support their own. That is something SCAD could not give anyone. Um, Savannah was so saturated with SCAD graduates that if you wanted an art job, unless you were just like amazingly good, you had to go, you needed to move elsewhere. So that is something to keep in mind. It's going, you're gonna end up paying to move there and then paying to move out without necessarily having a job to support that. And I have friends who will be paying their student loan debt probably forever. So um, I know when you're, you're 16, 17, 18, you're like, whatever, that's fine. I'll pay that off. But the thing is, it's going to affect your credit. You may not be able to buy a house, you may not be able to buy a car, you may not be able to start a life, you may not be able to get an apartment. So, you know, that is something to consider before you go into that kind of debt. And I'm not encouraging any of you from going into art as a career. It is hard. Um, and one day I'm going to do a video just about that, my experiences with pursuing art as a career. Um, I know some of you guys think I'm a child, which I don't like. I'm 30. I know I sound like Mickey Mouse. I'm 30. Um, so I'm sort of like the stepping stone between people who have an established career and people who are just out of school. Um, and I am self-employed. I make my money 
through a variety of artistic means. I do freelance work. I do um, conventions. I do my own comics, which I sell, which you can check out on my website. Um, I do teaching engagements. I do YouTube stuff. I write the blog. So, I mean, I have had to diversify um, what I do in order to eke out a living. And it's a really good thing that I like. I like people. So that helps with convention sales and it helps with teaching. I love teaching. I love, I'm very passionate about comics. I'm very passionate about illustration. I love sharing that with other people. I think that should be something that people in general can have access to. I want to sort of remove this need to pay, to get into debt, to go to an art college, especially because, you know, public schools, public colleges are becoming so STEM focused that you're not getting any sort of an art or music background. And I can't help you guys out with the music, but I can help you out with the art to an extent. So I'm, I'm very serious about that. That's something I feel very strongly about. And I want to inspire and encourage other people because um, I am not by any means, I am not by any means a genius. I am not by any means t very talented. I, I work really hard. I'm very passionate, but there are always going to be people better than me. There are always going to be young people way better than me because you guys have access to so many great things. And I don't want to stand in your way. I want to be remembered as that person who helped you out because I remember all the people who stood in my way and made life hard for me. And I also remember all the people who tried to help me out. So um, I'd rather be on the side of good than the side of evil. But you may, I mean, especially with like this sort of internet culture, you're going to probably find that you're going to be doing it on your own, doing your own promotion, doing, finding your own jobs, freelancing a whole lot um, before you necessarily get picked up by anywhere. And um, if you live in an area that doesn't necessarily have a large art scene, Nashville, Tennessee does not have much of a comic scene, um, you're really going to your chances of working in house for somebody may be kind of low, especially if you have a very uh, cartoony, very assertive, let's let's call it that sort of style um, or very feminine style. You may find it harder to find work. So you may be in my shoes where you're having to become a jack of all trades. Um, and in that instance, art school is just not really going to help you. I have this MFA that doesn't impress anybody. <laughs> here because you know they're so used to supporting their MTSU and their Watkins grads that they don't want to necessarily give an outsider a chance and I can respect that because um, I mean if you've only got so many jobs to go around you probably want to support your own local people and you want to support your own schools and that was something that New Orleans didn't really <laughs> do actually <laughs> um, not with UNO grads um, and SCAD couldn't do. So I really respect that there are places that do want to ensure that the graduates in their area can find work. So if you move for grad school, that may be something else you face or grad school, undergrad, whichever. Um, if you are, st even after all this, if you're still insistent on going to art school, I really recommend you go somewhere local, somewhere you can get a full ride scholarship to, if at all possible, for your first four years. And then if you really, really want to go to RISD, or you really, really want to go to SVA, or you really, really want to go to SCAD, get your graduate degree from there. It's going to cost less, and it takes less time. Um, and you know, you're also not starting from scratch. With a lot of these art schools, um, their undergrad program doesn't necessarily require portfolios to get in, which which can be good because somebody like I would not have gotten into SCAD as an undergraduate, I am pretty sure, if it had been portfolio-based. I got in as a graduate student when it was portfolio-based, um, but my academics sure helped. I was, I had a like a 3.8 when I graduated UNO, so I'm sure that didn't hurt one little bit. That's another thing. Even if you are an artist, you should take your academics as seriously as possible. Um, I had tops in Louisiana that was covering most of my tuition when I was going to UNO, so it was important for me to keep that. So I always had to stay on top of my grades, which was fine. I've always that's always been important to me. Um, I think education is the way out of a bad situation. Education is the way out of a place you don't like. So um, you know, I was very passionate about you know getting my education and going on to other things. So um, like that wasn't really 
a big struggle for me. I was happy to make the sacrifices to keep my grades up and do what I needed to do. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Like, don't blow off. If you're in high school and you want to go straight to grad, uh, want to go straight to an art undergrad, don't blow off your classes. I know you think drawing in class all day, because I was the same way. I know you think drawing in class all day, in math class, you know, that's, that's fine, right? I'm not going to need this. And you probably won't need it in your adult life. I don't use calculus. I don't use trig. Um, that's not bragging. That's just a fact. I do use algebra. That's important. And I do use geometry, also important. But I took physics in high school because I wanted to. I don't use physics. I mean, obviously, we all use physics. But I don't use... I don't have to sit here and do formulas to draw things. Um, but the my grades in high school, my grades in college opened up other doors for me. Um, so that you know that those are important things to consider. And I don't mean this to be a don't do art school kind of rant. I just... You know, a lot of those art schools, especially the big name ones, will really push how it's they are going to get you a job and they're going to open doors for you and they're going to do this, that and another thing. And SCAD did. They brought in editors to talk to us. They brought in other artists to talk to us. But there were so many students in the sequential art department, graduate, undergraduate, even professors, all competing for this attention, all competing for these jobs. Um you know, if you're the best of the best, the best and the brightest, or you have a really shiny personality, then it can be good for you. But I have, I have a shiny personality. Um, I was pretty well liked, but that, you know, that isn't the end all be all. It's just a spice in your spice rack. So I just, I just want to help you guys learn from some of the decisions that I've made, if that's at all possible. Um, I want to spare you some of the pain and the regret that I've seen. Uh, I'm fortunate I don't have any student debt. I had some scholarships and I also had a loved one pass away and leave me some inheritance. So at least I'm not in debt. And I think that money was spent the way they would have wanted me to spend that money. So, you know, but I, I, many, many people are not in that sort of a situation and they they attend these schools and they rack up just, I have a friend who's 120K in debt. She's paid about 30K a year and she lives in a very expensive place to live and um, she's not making any progress on her student debt. She's not on paying it off. She's barely breaking even. She can barely pay her own rent. So, and she's a, she's a good person. She's a great artist. Um, it's certainly not because she's not good enough. And I haven't been talking about what I'm doing. I apologize for those of you who are just watching this to learn about like Copic stuff. And you're like, why am I getting an art school lecture? Um, that was intended for my main audience. I, I apologize. Um, I'm mostly working in the violets fa uh, family for these little purple flowers. And these are flowers that are commonly found along the roadside. And I have Google images brought up on the screen you can't see. Um, so I'm working from that. And I really enjoy doing flowers in marker from reference. Those of you who follow my blog have seen my succulents drawings. And I'll probably end up doing some on YouTube as well because I do love doing those. Um, and those are marker and watercolor. So I definitely love drawing flowers in marker from reference. It's murder on my markers though. It really runs them down. You know, that's what's hard about doing these sort of videos and just chatting with you guys. Um, but I can't see any of you and I can't get a response sometimes. I was going somewhere and I go off on a tangent and I forget where I was going. I think the only thing I can remember is how frustrating it is when people assume I'm a kid or a teenager based on my voice. Because I, I put some good time in. Definitely put some man hours in.
and there are indeed very many very skilled very talented kids on YouTube so I don't want to take away from them either okay so those flowers are pretty much done and what I really want to do now is just go in and sort of add a, a bit of green dark green like a grassiness to some of these stems And uh, now that y'all know I'm 30 uh, and you still think I'm a kid, like that's that's different, you know. I I see 17 year olds who are not kids, but I I'm like, oh, those kids so talented these days have access to such great software. Like they're not kids, but they're younger than me, so in my head, they're still kids. So if that's like where you're coming from, that's that's different. I just don't want you guys thinking I'm, you know much less younger and less educated than I am. I earned that education. And when I, when I point out that art school isn't for everyone, it's not because I'm not proud of the time I did or, you know, the degrees I've earned. It's just because it's not for everybody and it's very expensive. Um, and these schools, when you go into tour, will often tell you, yeah, yeah, you're a great fit. Perfect. It's perfect for you. This is going to be great. You're going to love it. And, you know, I, you know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're surrounded by people who actually don't care at all about making comics or they have a very narrow minded view of what comics are or should be and if what you're making isn't what they're interested in they're gonna tear you apart so that's just something else to keep in mind you know I mean your your classes your critiques are filled with other human beings who have their own tastes and have their own opinions and have their own um not needs but you know like like you know just because they say something really harsh to you doesn't necessarily make it true it's always worth considering and what I had found really helpful is I would I would stay up late working on projects especially when I started doing watercolor stuff like that was so time consuming even if I plan my time well I still would end up being up late night before the critique adding some finishing touches um, and I would just be so fried that when I went into critique, I would have to take notes on what was said about my work so that when I was less tired, less emotional, um, had gotten some sleep, I could look at what was said and apply that to my work when, when necessary. Okay, so we're almost done. We're pretty much just at the point where we need to tighten up the flowers and I'm gonna use a Mitsuo Ida. That was what I used to ink with, so that's what I'm gonna use to add details back with. And that just sort of cleans it up. And a lot of the things I experienced is more just like old school garbage that carried over way too long. So I think many of you will not have to deal with some of the things I had to deal with. And I'm excited about that as I'm ready to see some change in comics. I'm ready to see some widespread change. I think, I think a lot of people are. That's why webcomics are so popular. And while I was at SCAD, they were still treated as like this unviable thing. Why are you giving away your IP? And like, I understand that mindset too, but you know what? A lot of us are not gonna sit around waiting for Editor Charming to come in and save our work. We have stories we wanna tell and you know, if you're going all this trouble to make pages, why not share them? And there are a lot of phenomenal comic artists who A, got their start doing web comics, or B, are still doing phenomenal web comics and making good money off of it. So, you know, but that was just like a business model that was new to some of those professors. So they didn't really know, know how to advise regarding that. And they were they were going with their gut. They were going with, you know, they had good intentions. You know, don't 
don't give your work away for free. Um, so I'm not faulting them. I'm just point using that as an example of like, this is clearly something that people have been doing for 10 years. And many of them do make money from it. Many of them do form careers doing that, but it was advised against at that school. And uh, that might, that attitude might be completely different now. Things do change. 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 In general, I really like how these daisies turned out, where you can see the background through them. I think that's so cool. I'm gonna use that trick again. See, that's how you get techniques: is you try something you've never done, and maybe it doesn't go the way you thought it was gonna go, but now you have something different. why I get really frustrated with these um, YouTube, like it tends to be stampers, but these YouTube videos where it's like, watch me color. And it's always like the same sort of topic over and over again, except, you know, they change the stamp subject matter. So it's like, here's a girl with a balloon. Here's a girl with this. Here's a girl with that. And they don't ever try anything new. Um, and there's definitely stampers who also try like exciting new things, right? Like, so for every bad example, there's definitely a good example. Um, but I like trying new things in front of you guys and I like taking risks and I like potentially failing. Um, well, I hate potentially failing, who, who likes it? But you don't get a new technique if you don't um, read new sources or try new things or take risks. So, you know, as much as I don't like the act of failure. I do like the rewards of failure in that I really enjoy um, when something turns out better than I thought it would. Okay, so this is almost done. There are a few things I still want to do. So I'm gonna grab the materials for those and pick up some of these markers, clear off my table a bit and I'll get back to you guys. All right guys, it's time for some finishing touches and I have a white Signo gel pen and I've got my Copic Opaque White and a small brush. And I like saving some of these corrections to the very end. I mean, you have to with those Signo anyway, pretty much. Um, but I, hmm, not gonna need the Signo so much except for patterns. And there are artists who swear by jelly rolls. Um, and as much as I like Sakura as a company, and I do, I don't have great luck with jelly rolls. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's me or the pen. Maybe it's the humidity. I mean, that can be a factor for all sorts of things. But um, I've always had good luck with Signos. I've been using them for several years. There was a point in time where I kept getting bad batches and I was looking for a new gel pen, but it seems like we're back on track now. You can also do designs and markers, and I have videos where I do that, but I have so much going on in this picture that I really kind of wanted to keep this element kind of simple but still fun. And I think patchwork is really cute. I would not do, I would not, I dress Kara in a way that I would not dress my own child. Uh, mostly because, you know, <laughs> Preteen girls definitely have their own ideas about what they want to wear. I was the same way. I'm not going to begrudge my daughter that or my son. I mean, let my kids kind of pick within reason what they want to wear. We'll see how that goes. Probably end up regret saying that. But my mom let me be pretty autonomous once I reached a certain age about wearing what I wanted to wear. I had a phase in third grade where I only wore things from the boys section because I did want people to think I was a boy because I didn't like how little girls were treated. 
Um, and then I had my like teeny bopper goth phase when I was in high school, all four years. So I wore a lot of Hot Topic back when Hot Topic sold trip pants. I wore their skirts, trip skirts, because um, I didn't really like tri trip pants that much. So I'll probably make the same mistakes in, in air quotes with my kids. But Kara is not a real child. I have to pick out her clothes. So I dress her the way I want to dress her. And in the comic, I try to dress her practically over anything else. But in illustrations, I love like finding the most whimsical children's wear that looks like something she would wear and dressing her in that. In fact, I have a Pinterest board, um, which is called like Kara clothes, I think, um, which is more popular than my art on Pinterest. So I guess people think I have good taste. <laughs> I tried like sneaking comic images in there. Didn't work. They did, were not fooled. But I know I'm going to have to relinquish. Uh, the ability to dress my children like little dolls. I'm not going to be able to do that for too long. Some white highlights over here to the bottom. This is usually my favorite part. Mostly, probably because like everything's done by now. But I think really it's because everything is like really starting to come together. I think I've mentioned on here, I think I've mentioned it a couple times, that my mom, she might not be into it anymore. She used to be kind of into doing coloring books for adults. Mostly like, um sort of like just geometric abstract kind of shapes uh she did it to sort of like chill out at the end of a stressful day and uh i had high hopes of like i guess um kind of like bullying her and like you know in the way that daughters can like uh -huh, come on mom twisting her arm into trying like like watercolor maybe um i was going to show her how to do it but trying watercolor, just like any of the things that I, I really love sharing that with her. Um, but it did not, it did not take off. Which I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit disappointed about. Like, uh, she didn't shoot me down, but it was just sort of like that, that's overcomplicating why I do this. And I didn't want to, to pressure her into something she really didn't want to do. I just, you know, wanted to show her. I guess how to do like some really simple watercolor. And I may end up, if I tell her it's for a video, oh shoot, dang it. Rube Goldberg of Art Supplies Falling. Um, I'm going to go visit her in a couple of weeks uh, and I may, I may be able to convince her while I'm there to just like, let me do it for a video. It's good teaching practice too, because she can then tell me like what I'm doing too fast, what I need to go over more. Because when I teach kids, they they get, sometimes they get really like um, bashful and they don't want to say slow down because you know they don't want to be seen as stupid. And I mean they're not stupid. You're never stupid if you say that. That's not an indication of intelligence at all. You know sometimes your teacher, sometimes I will go too fast because I'm used to it and you know you should say slow down because that's my mistake but she would definitely call me out if I was going too fast so that would that would be an educational experience for me good practice I've taught 
on numerous, numerous occasions. I've done many TA ships, but I still always feel like um, I have more to learn. Although I do not want to teach full time because I'm not really a big fan of, you know, how art has been sort of um, minimalized as much as possible in class, in, in a school setting. You know, I think it's really important. So it breaks my heart that it's treated that way. But I do like teaching it. So that's one of the reasons why I do these videos. I really enjoy showing you guys stuff. I think I think we're done. She looks so she's so startled. She looks so scared, but she's really just startled. And I like how those daisies came out. They sort of look reminiscent of like the stuff my mom had from the 70s where um, because they're not using digital processes, there's a lot of the hand of the artist involved. There's a lot they can't control. Ah, if I had an example, I would show you guys. Unfortunately, I don't. But it reminds me of that and I like it. So I am excited that I learned that technique. And this was fun. And um, if you enjoy, if you like this finished illustration, if you think it looks cute, um, it is for sale. Send me an email if you're interested. Um, but I really recommend you check out my ongoing children's graphic novel, Seven Inch Kara. Volume one is available in my store. And if you watch my intro to comic craft videos, you can watch me working on volume two. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where she comes from. This is Kara, she's seven inches tall. And um, if you're new to my channel, I would love it if you subscribed. I would love it even more if you subscribed and shared this video with your friends, especially if any of them are interested in this sort of stuff. Or if any of them were thinking about art school, you know, they can hear my little, my little meandering tirade about art school. Um, I think that's about it. I'm Becca Hilburn. This is Natto Soup Studio. Um, if you enjoy content like this and you would like to see more and you'd like to help fund more, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup for information about that. And for seven years worth of this sort of content, including reviews, demonstrations, and tutorials, please check out my blog at natosoup.blogspot.com. I will see you guys around. I hope you have a great day. Bye!